And John Mahamboy talks about how he was stuck on concentration for many years. He had the wrong view that if he tended to his concentration steadily enough, the quiet of the concentration would turn into the quiet of Nibbana. The interesting thing is that he was with Ajahn Man all that time, and Ajahn Man let him stay stuck on concentration for quite a while. And it's good to think about why. Perhaps he saw that Ajahn Mahabha was going to have to do some radical work with this discernment, and that kind of radical work requires really strong concentration. Partly because you need a lot of stillness to see subtle things in the mind. But also you need a safe space, a place where you feel at home, at ease, you feel confident, so that when disturbing thoughts come up in the mind, you're not shaken. Because there are a lot of defilements that are pretty disturbing. Sometimes your greed, your aversion, your delusion can take very strange forms, forms that you wouldn't like anyone to see. And you get to the point where you don't want to see them yourself. And so little messages get sent around in the mind, and you turn a blind eye to them. You're like a teacher in a classroom where the kids are sending notes to one another, and the teacher for some reason doesn't want to know. So the notes get sent back and forth, little perceptions, little bits and snatches of thoughts, enough to keep those defilements alive, but not enough to let them come up to the surface. They're there in the background, and they create a sense of dis-ease. This is where free-floating anxiety comes from. There's a disconnect in the mind. It's not that the anxiety has no focus. It has a focus, but you don't want to look at it. And because it's, things like this are so uncomfortable, this is why psychotherapists have to create a safe atmosphere in their offices. So whatever comes up, whatever is talked about, the patient doesn't feel threatened. And in a way, you're doing analysis on yourself. When you start looking into these things, you become the kind of teacher who wants to see the notes as they're passed back and forth. But you have to put yourself in a position where you're not shaken by any possible message that might be in those notes. So this is why we work on the concentration, especially where we work on the breath. Because when there's, ang when there's anxiety, the defilements have appropriated your breath, the breath energy in the body, and you've got to reclaim it so you can be in the position of strength and not feel threatened. So as long as your concentration is alert and mindful, don't be afraid of getting stuck on it. You're going to need this safe space. All too often you hear people saying, well, you get stuck on concentration and you're never going to get anywhere. It's bizarre that for years and years when people would talk about concentration, say, especially in Vipassana retreats, the very first thing they would talk about is how dangerous it was, forgetting, of course, that it's part of the path. And with right concentration, it's not dangerous. The dangers are in the wrong concentration. Concentration without alertness, without discernment, without mindfulness. Concentration with wrong view. These kinds of concentration can knock you off course, but it doesn't take much to know what's on course and what's off course. Getting involved in visions is off course. Allowing yourself to go into delusion concentration, that's also off course. That's when things get comfortable and you begin to drift. 
mind has no clear focal point. It just feels very pleasant, very still. But there's no discernment, there's no alertness. That's off course. That's the kind of dangerous concentration where you're just wasting a lot of time. The concentration that's not a waste of time is concentration when you're very alert. You notice what the mind is doing, how the mind is settling in with the breath. At what point you don't need any more conversation in the mind about the breath. You can just be with the sensation of the breathing. Go into the sensation of the breathing. And allow things to be very still. Some people complain that everything gets so still that they can't follow the breath anymore. Well, think of the breath energy filling the body. And it's still. There is such a thing as still energy. And as long as you're clearly aware of that still energy through the body, you're fine. And then as you come out of concentration, try to notice where the mind goes. It's like letting the kids out of school. Where do they go running to first? And sometimes something interesting will pop up, something unexpected will pop up, as the mind is freed from its focal point with the breath. And something you may want to look into further. Why does the mind go there? This is one of the ways in which concentration can lead to insight. Another is when you've been sitting in meditation for a while and you, you know that it's going to end shortly. And you turn down the burner on your concentration, let's put it that way. The focal point, the concentration not quite so intense. And it's still there, it's still very still, but it's not so all-consuming that thoughts won't be able to come in. And again, when a thought comes in, some some of the thoughts will have an allure, they'll have a hook. And we want to ask ourselves why? What's there? What of any substance is there? That old analysis of looking for the allure and the drawbacks. This is how you do it. In a way, it's like that old campaign they had back in the People's Republic back in the 50s. It was called Let a Thousand Flowers Bloom. All of a sudden, the government announced that there would be freedom of speech. And so a few people spoke out, and everybody else watched to see what happened, and nothing happened. So more people spoke out, and then more people spoke out. Meanwhile, the government was taking note. When it figured out enough people had spoken out criticizing this or that policy, then they finally swooped down and got them all. So in the same way, you want to give a little space for your defilements to speak a little bit, so you can to know what they have to say. Once you hear what they have to say, then you can do something about them. Now there may come times when something comes up and it really is disturbing, and you don't feel you're ready for it yet. Well, don't push yourself. Go back to the concentration. They have a very matter-of-fact attitude toward it. Okay, there is that particular thought in the mind, that particular attitude, and it's going to require a lot of parsing out. But at least you begin to know what it is. It's better than having it lurking in the background. Because when it lurks in the dark, you have no, no idea of how big it is. But when you begin to see it, you see well, it's not quite as big as you thought it was. And it has a shape, and it begins to have a specific agenda that you can understand. And you know that someday you'll be able to talk to it. So this way you're doing therapy on yourself. 
And with the concentration, you're providing the safe space. Now, however long it takes to create that safe space, it's time well spent. Think of John Mahabu of many years. I think it was six years altogether. It may sound like a long time, but once it was done, he had a space in the mind where he could deal with whatever came up. And that's what you want in our rush for insights. We have to make sure first that we have a safe space in which to deal with them when they come up. Because one of the aspects of the Buddhist path is that it's a safe path. If you make sure that your views are right and everything all the way down the line, your resolves are right and your concentration is right and your mindfulness is right, you're safe. It's when you wander off the path. Think of the Buddha's image of the people who take their cart off the main road into the forest, and the axle breaks and everything falls apart. Whereas if they'd stayed on the main road, they would have been able to get to their destination. <laughs>